We turn now to the study of movement. Movement is what we observe. It's not quite the same thing as behavior, which is more an interpretation of movement. And we'll be concerned with many kinds of movements. We won't be strongly distinguishing in most cases between movements of animals and movements of humans. Um, but we're going to begin with what might seem like an odd question. What does the brain actually do? Now, we attribute all kinds of things to brains. We attribute our very essence to brains. This might be mistaken. The brain can be viewed in many ways. What we're going to view it here is simply as an organ of the body on par with kidneys and no more the producer of anything magical than a kidney is the producer of anything magical. So we're looking at the brain from a physiological point of view as part of the body. And under those circumstances, what we'd have to say is that what the brain does is very limited, actually. We can say that the brain regulates hormones within the body and other chemicals, including, interestingly, neurotransmitters, which are chemicals that affect the brain itself. So the brain regulates the internal chemical soup of the body, including its own chemical soup. That's kind of weird. And the other thing we can say is that it moves muscles, because if we follow the projections from the brain to the periphery, where do we stop? Well, we stop at those sites where nerves bring their activity to bear on something other than the nervous system itself, and those are muscles. So, to a brain scientist, movement science would seem to be of the utmost importance, surely. Now, this is not the way you usually think about brains. But remember, we cannot observe thought. Thought has never been observed. Perception has never been observed. It's not an empirical object of study. It's a way of talking about our being in the world. We certainly cannot observe reason or language in the brain. Now, we can build theories about how brains might be important in thinking, perception, and reasoning, and possibly some other things. Um, but even language itself can only be observed through either sound or writing or gestures. Um, in other words, it's through the movement of the body that we find out anything at all about the owner of that body. Now, when we turn our attention then to movement, we are definitely not taking the conventional anthropocentric stance of cognitive science. We're not holding humans out as some kind of special thing. We are viewing ourselves as part of the natural order. And the principles of movement are held in common across species. And as we'll see, there are some very fundamental principles of movement that are very, very important and that have great repercussions for how we ultimately um, understand our own movements. Now, if we adopt an evolutionary point of view, we would say that there's lots of reasons to privilege movement. Um, animals that can move can find their own food. Animals that don't move have to wait for their food to find them. Animals that can move can avoid predators, they can hide, or alternatively, they can hunt. Uh, animals that can move can find somewhere safe to be. If you can't move, you're at a definite disadvantage. And I don't have to point out the advantages of being able to move in order to find a mate. So let's consider, taking this peculiar stance, let's consider one rather odd organ, uh, organism here, the sea squirt. And the philosopher Daniel Dennett has described its life cycle somewhat inaccurately like this. The juvenile sea squirt wanders through the sea, searching for a suitable rock or hunk of coral to cling to and make its home for life. Isn't that nice? For this task, it has a rudimentary nervous system. When it finds its spot and takes root, it doesn't need its brain anymore, so it eats it. It's rather like getting tenure, he says, and he should know it as he is obtained tenure a long time ago. That's, as I said, slightly inaccurate. The sea squirt undergoes a metamorphosis. You're familiar with the idea of metamorphosis and the transition from a caterpillar to a butterfly. 
many animals undergo a significant complete change in their bodily structures at some stage in their life cycle. The sea squirt does too. And in the context of that metamorphosis, its nervous system, which is fairly rudimentary, is digested. Um, now, from a, an economic point of view, I suppose, this makes perfect sense because ganglia, that is mini brains, clumps of neurons, consume a lot of resources. And while the nervous system is extremely useful if you have to navigate the perils of an unpredictable world, and you have to respond quickly to threats, um, a sedentary organism doesn't necessarily need that. And so it makes metabolic sense to dispense with the nervous system once the animal has adopted a fixed spot. Now notice what's happened here. The nervous system has been cast as being relevant to locomotion. That's its purpose in the life of this animal. And locomotion is one of the most basic ways to talk about movement. Locomotion just means getting around moving and there's a bewildering diversity of forms of locomotion so we have the pulsing of a jellyfish in the sea the many legs of a centipede the um, flight of a bat the swinging of primates through the trees we've got six-legged animals four-legged animals two-legged animals would you believe um, all these diverse forms of locomotion might all appear to be different, but actually they all share some common underlying principles and that those commonalities can inform us about some principles of the operation of the nervous system. One form of locomotion is signally missing from all those, and that's the wheel. Now we find wheels incredibly useful, don't we? Whoever invented the wheel did a good job that day. Wheels are simple, and there, if you want to build a truck or a means of carrying heavy stuff from one place to the other, a wheel is useful. And yet, if we look around all the animals, we don't see wheeled animals. Evolution is a great tinkerer. Um, it's extremely good at coming up with uh, very complex structures. Why did it not discover the wheel when we did? And we're nowhere near as clever as evolution. Well, there is an answer to this question, oddly. A wheel is not a disc. A wheel is a disc that spins around a fixed axle. So the axle has to remain fixed while the wheel rotates. And we do find this structure in nature. We find it specifically in some bacteria, including the E. coli bacterium uh, that populates your intestines. And it uses the wheel-like structure in order to rotate long projections called flagellae that propel it forward. And yet, we don't find it in large animals. And the reason is this. For a large animal, every part of the body has requirements, nutrient requirements and requirements of getting rid of waste products as well. And that requires plumbing of some sort. At the scale of the bacterium, which is very, very tiny, the provision of nutrients and the removal of waste products can be done um, just through chemical diffusion means. But for a larger animal, this would require supply with um, lymph or blood. Uh, it would require cabling or plumbing of some sort. And if you have a fixed disc that rotates, uh, uh, sorry, a moving disc that rotates around a fixed axle, you can't have any plumbing from the axle to the wheel. So that's why the wheel doesn't scale up. It's a great solution and nature did find it, but it doesn't scale up when you're, you've got the requirement, which bodies have, of supplying their tissues with the stuff they need. Okay, so much for wheels. Um, one of the pioneers in the study of movement, and one well worth your attention, and I'm going to put, place a video about this guy in the required viewing, for this week is Edward Muybridge. He lived in the 19th century and he was a bit of a pioneer. He was out in the Wild West in California and he was a photographer and photography was a, a young art at this stage, having been first really invented in the 1820s and 30s. Um, there were not many photographers around and he was one of the first people to photograph some of the main la natural landmarks of California. 
But he was a, a very intense man, a very interesting life story that I'll refer you to the video for. Um, but he was passionately interested in the study of movement. And one kind of question that arose at the time might seem like a non-question to you. The question of whether a horse ever has all four feet off the ground when galloping. Believe it or not, if you don't have photographs, that's a very difficult question to answer because everything's moving so fast. Um, but Moybridge set up a very elaborate studio in which a long series of cameras were arranged to be triggered by tripwire. In those days, taking a single photograph was a laborious business and you couldn't just take one photograph and then another photograph like you can on your camera. Um, so this required a great deal of technical ingenuity and he produced then a huge series of studies of humans and animals in motion, including this famous picture. You've seen these pictures. They're all over the internet. Sometimes they're animated, but they come from this wonderful study of human and animal motion by Edward Muybridge. And there in the, uh, in the top row, you can clearly see the question has an answer and the photography allowed us to answer it. Yes, the horse does have four feet off the ground when galloping. Not in other gates, mind you, but this is peculiar to galloping. So Edward Muybridge introduced a certain poetry to the study of movement. And we are sensitive to movement, and I noted before that we typically think of our movements as, ex as being the expression of some kind of behavior. And behavior is when we understand movement as serving a purpose. So if we say the jellyfish is locomoting, that's a behavioral description. We've taken the movement and we've said that serves some kind of purpose. And we can't stop ourselves doing this. We are exquisitely sensitive to goal-directed movement. So I'm going to show you just a couple of moving white dots. And let's see what you see. Now, those are just moving white dots, and if I'm not mistaken, I don't know what you see, but if I'm not mistaken, what you probably saw was a person kicking and punching and doing various well-defined kinds of activities, any one of which could be described as a behavior. And you saw that in just the movement of a bunch of little white dots on a blue screen. That can tell you that you are predisposed to interpret things which are moving as organized, and uh, where the movement arises from some purposeful activity. If it's not purposeful, it's very hard to interpret. Um, so we're going to turn our attention to several kinds of locomotion in this series. And one of the first things we're going to have to deal with is our standard way of thinking about the brain. When it comes to movement science, we have to think differently about the brain. We tend to think of the brain as a controller. We say the brain controls the body. That language is dangerous. It's slippy. It's not well defined. The notion of control is very, very, very difficult notion. Um, it makes us feel good if we believe that we control all our actions and it allows us to apportion responsibility in a certain way. But it's a peculiar thing to land on the brain. So if we take the notion of control in a simple, literal fashion, we end up with a thoroughly wrong idea of what's going on in animal motion. So here's what's not going on in locomotion. Although you will find stories like this in school textbooks, for example. The brain decides where the foot should go next, and then the brain figures out which muscle combination will get it there, and then the brain commands those muscles to move just enough, and then that cycle is repeated. That is absolutely not what is going on in locomotion. Okay, I want you to look at those verbs. Decide, figures out, and commands. Brains do not decide anything. Remember, we're adopting a physiological stance. It's inappropriate to say that a brain ever made a decision or that a brain ever figured something out. Did your ear ever figure something out? Brains also don't see. Eyeballs don't see either. Brains don't feel. Brains, you see, are not people. And we have developed the unfortunate habit 
of taking our people talk, our talk about ourselves, and projecting a lot of that onto brains. Of course, the brain is supremely important in the constitution of the person, but figuring out what its role is and how we should best view it in different circumstances is much more difficult. Brains are organs of the body. They are not people. People do decide and see and feel, but we tend to attribute an awful lot to the brain. So I'm going to wrap up this video with a, an implausible picture of the brain. There's a brain. Yes, that is not a realistic picture of the brain. I think you'll agree. And we, there are many unrealistic pictures of the brain, even within science. So uh, that'll give us a lot to think about in the next few videos.